Bonjour, hello, welcome to Data and Digital Transformation presentation. I introduce myself, Migi Tauban, Partnership Advisor at Ivado, and I will be the moderator of this presentation. A few elements before starting. Time is very precious today because the presentations flow one another. So please be understanding when I tell you that there are two minutes left or that is the time for the last question. Speaking of questions, please use the question tab in the chat, which should appear to the right of your screen to share them. And we will be happy to report your question to the speakers at the end of the presentation because there is no audio. Now, without further ado, let me introduce the speakers. So we have with us the Vol Shah, the Director of Innovation at the Bank of Canada. He, he has over 15 years of experience in the areas of management, consulting, engineering, and your goods retailing. With him, we have Eric Balodis, Program Director, Enterprise Data and Analytics Strategy. Eric joined the Bank of Canada in 2007 and has held roles in technical project management, product development, and quality and operation. Gentlemen, I give you the floor. Thank you so much uh, for having us. Uh, as, as we you said, my name is Deval. I'm the Director of Innovation at the, at the Bank of Canada analytics strategy. So um, today my colleague and I will be giving you a glimpse into our uh, data and digital transformation uh, journey at the Bank of Canada. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have uh, at, the, at the end of the presentation. But before we get started, just a quick note to let you know that these are the views of just Eric and myself and does not reflect the views of our, of our governing council. On to the next slide, please, Eric. So uh, today, you know, we can't solve all our problems by using the same, same kind of thinking that we used when we created them. It's, it's time uh, we change that. Uh, we officially started the digital transformation program at the bank a little over a year ago now. Uh, it was, we were doing this all the time, but it was really putting a name to what was, uh, what was happening all around us. Next slide, please. So when people say, what does digital even mean? Um, you know, I came across this really uh, interesting statement from Apolitical, uh, and it said, it's applying the culture, the processes, the business models, the technologies of the internet era uh, to respond to the, uh, the people's raised expectations. And again, for us, it's about putting people at the, at the forefront of our transformation. And at the pace at which technology is going today, uh, and, and changing all around us. We are at, a, we are at a, a disadvantage or even at a risk of being left behind if, uh, and we will be playing catch up uh, for a long time if we don't really uh, take advantage of, of the transformation that we're on right now. So what did we do? Uh, uh, we came up with a very bold statement, you know, and our vision says to be a digital first in every aspect of our business. It, it means we have to be uh, we have to be doing everything because it's it's about our business. It's about what we do. Uh, it's about us achieving our mandate. Uh, sorry, one slide back, please. It's about achieving our mandate to promote the, the financial and, and economic well-being of, of Canada, uh, uh, to do the very best economic analysis and, and policy. We need to use the latest and greatest technologies, for example. With, with five uh, five digital principles, you know, we, we called it work digitally. So things involves, um, I'm going to talk to you about a program called Pivot. It's about exper experimentation, iterating, collaborating. It's about focusing on services. It's about enabling openness, minimizing barriers and strengthening our, our governance. Um, as I said, we're on, we're on, we're on a journey, uh, and I'm going to touch on one example uh, of our transformation, and we call it Pivot. Uh, and hopefully, it will reflect the five principles uh, that we talked about. So as you can see on the slide there, what is, what is Pivot? Uh, Pivot is, is, in short, is called Partnerships in Innovation and, and Technology. Um, so why, why are we doing this, right? Uh, in a nutshell, it's our open innovation uh, platform that we use where we put interesting challenges and problems on, on the web uh, uh, re pertaining obviously to the Bank of Canada and we collaborate with a slew of companies, large, small, medium enterprises, academics, um, folks not just locally but uh, across the globe really. It's about it's about experimentation and, and learning from, from each other. Uh, 
and you know what at the bank we could probably solve most of the challenges that that we come up with but to be honest with you um there are other the people out there that are just as smart or even smarter or have a better way of approaching approaching a problem or solving a problem for us and for us it's about uh learning from from them and to see if there's another way that that we can do this uh next slide please eric so what's in it for you uh, you know you may be wondering like what are the benefits of this program uh why are you talking about it uh you get to work with you know some top-notch researchers and 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 folks in in their fields of study at, at the bank of canada uh your solutions obviously that you provide to those challenges could help uh in a meaningful way uh to impact um uh, not only our research but also our operations um obviously by helping the bank of canada you're in you're in indirectly helping canadians uh, and you get to work with one of the, the leading central banks. I'm, I'm going to boast <laughs> a little bit there. Um, just to give you a glimpse of some of those challenges that we have online or that we have done so far. I'm not going to go through all of them uh, because I, I do want to uh, respect the time. But, you know, there are things around French language evaluation using AI and ML uh, to see if, you know, based on my language skills, you know, am I level one, two, three or four as an example. Um, look at economic uh, household measuring, uh, sorry, household spending measures, and again, leveraging some, some interesting models that were developed by a PhD student out of Waterloo. Uh, payment fraud detec uh, detection, obviously, we, we see a lot of, uh, and we see a lot of data that comes into our, into our organizations, you know, using some novel techniques to see if there's things that our systems cannot catch, uh, other ways to find things. Um, Everyone talks about improving data cleaning, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So how can we improve our data from the get-go? How can we catch those errors that, 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 that are presented when we get all this data, et cetera? And, and the last one there is, you know, um, we are dabbling into the, the quantum space right now. There's a lot of quantum research that's happening, but we want to use quantum for some practical reasons. So uh, one of the challenges that we have online that we just closed right now when working on it is around uh, complex optimization problems, um, primarily within our within the the payment systems. Uh, again, you know, as as Pivot sort of highlighted, uh, it's just one of many many examples that we have at the bank around digital transformation. What we're doing in that space, um, you know, I talked about the the digital principles around working digitally. Absolutely, we're experimenting, we're collaborating with with colleagues. It's it's focusing on service. Uh, it's enabling openness, so we, we, we share data, we share information with, with the partners that we work with. It's about minimizing barriers, right? Like we're a risk-averse organization, so how do we do that? How do we uh, bring in new policy, new technologies uh, in, into, the, into the organization? And it's about strengthening the, the governance and the, and the culture around, uh, around uh, digital. Um, but that's just me speaking, and, and you know, let, let's, let's see what others have to say about it. So, Eric, if you just want to play the quick video. We came in with a very open-ended question. We knew what we wanted to do, but we didn't really have expectations on what would happen. I let that go organically. The thing that surprised me the most is how open they were to new innovation. Innovations in machine learning, artificial intelligence are really pushing how the economy is going. Many of us new people uh, in the We're literally stepping into the unknown together. That makes me excited. Le programme qui va donner l'opportunité à la banque de collaborer avec des gens avec lesquels on pourrait pas collaborer euh, habituellement. With their expertise, they were very influential in guiding the study and pushing the project forward. Such a good opportunity to expand your tool set and to expand your contacts. They frame this as an experiment. I'm a big believer on experimentation. It's an environment where it's okay to fail fast. The good thing about failure is that you can learn from your mistakes. The insights that you can draw from in real time are really interesting. We had no idea if we could actually do this. This was an experiment. The real experiment is that there's some element of risk taken. And that's all positive in terms of knowledge building and to help uh, push us forward. Going to the bank, you get to see new use cases and look at data from a different perspective. Experiments with high frequency search query data. Using artificial intelligence to do language evaluations more seamlessly. Yeah, it's nice to see that bridge between sort of the theory and the actual practice of what is being done here at the Central Bank. It's helping us continuously evolve and innovate. We are going to escape what we've learned here. 
and build upon it. It was a great experience, and I feel like at the end of the program, I certainly learned a lot. Love to take part again in, in the in the Pippet program. The Pippet program for us has been a big success because we've learned something new. We've given an external partner, and again, it helps with a conversation we wouldn't have otherwise had. To work with the Bank of Canada with their reputation, with their uh, their security measures, um, you know, it, it it I mean, it's a dream client. Great, thanks, Eric, for that. Uh, I'll pass it on to you, Eric, uh, who will share a lot, uh, a bit more about our EDAS uh, story. Uh, Eric, over to you. Thanks, Deval. And I think the eagle-eyed viewers will, will will see in that video there was a much shorter-haired version of Deval uh, participating in one of the uh, in one of the workshops there. Um, so thanks. I, I think you know, as you you probably know, it's impossible to talk about digital transformation without also talking about the role of data and analytics, and you know, the bank's most visible business is really the conduct of monetary policy. And this has always been kind of a data-driven business. Um, so by that, I mean, you know, it's effectively informed by economic and financial data. Um, in other parts of the organization, and in particular, a lot of our corporate administration functions, we're still sort of developing that muscle memory for leveraging data in operational and administrative decision making. So what I'll present here is basically a bit of a story kind of with a few sort of tips and tricks, things that we've learned along the way. Um, so to make sure that our strategy landed with the bank, we kind of undertook a fairly extensive consultation process. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we landed on three primary goals and three different areas of focus. So we wanted to accelerate the use of data in our policy development and business decision making. We wanted to optimize our use of data by leveraging data science, advanced analytics, and rigorous data and information management practices. And then we wanted to collaborate more effectively with our peers from across the bank, um, but also with our external partners. And by sort of applying these three different lenses in terms of areas of focus, we were able to sort of calibrate strategic actions specifically um, for these three areas. So broad cross-cutting activities, those that really only apply to sort of our um, our economic functions, and then those that are sort of applicable to our uh, corporate administration and operations groups. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about data maturity. I'm going to skip this sort of discussion about technology and process. I think that's you know very well understood. So data maturity for us was super valuable. Um, the concept of data maturity is fairly broadly accepted now. There's a whole bunch of different models out there. We tended to gravitate towards the Gartner model, um, and it basically provides you an assessment of an organization's capabilities across a number of different dimensions. Um, generally, that spans people, process, and technology. So you might find a dimension like interconnected data, which looks at data standards, consolidation, and interoperability. So basically by by leveraging this data maturity framework we were able to kind of you know determine a point in time maturity for the organization but also pick a maturity state that we could sort of aspire to and have a roadmap for getting there that you know has been validated against a number of different organizations and and sort of accepted broadly as a as a good path um and just as importantly, I think it's a conceptually easy tool for explaining data and analytics investments to management. So, you know, it becomes very simple. If you see yourself as a data, data organization with this level of maturity, then you're going to have to invest sort of in this way. Um, you know, if we move on to another area that I think is, is really a, an ongoing sort of pressing concern, it's culture. So I'll give you sort of a concrete example. My team was asked to develop a dashboard for COVID that would find its way into board reporting. So we developed a product that we thought was pretty good. It was, you know, highly visual. It was, it integrated data from across the organization. It brought in exogenous data to paint a picture of local, regional, and national um, situations. And it landed like a lead balloon, right? Nobody, nobody really wanted it. And the question was why, right? You know, basically, we're just not ready at a, at a, broad scale for that type of exploratory data product in some parts of the organization. And in particular, where we were developing this product, it was finance and board reporting, which is very sort of traditional, if I can put it that way. So what ended up happening is they took that beautiful dashboard, pulled it apart, isolated one thing that they wanted, and then produced two pages of uninterrupted text to sort of surround it, right? 
And so it's it's not an indictment of their work, really. It's just a reflection that as an organization, we're not culturally quite at the point where, you know, these types of data products are, you know, extremely widely accepted or developed or, or sort of digested. So we're still on this, this cultural journey. Um, I'll kind of point to another area that I think is super important, and this is leadership. So, so much of our data and analytics journey lives and dies with our leadership. Decision-making models and investment decisions all live at that sort of level. And if there's no compelling intention to sort of reorganize corporate decision processes uh, to better leverage data, or there's no champion for data and analytics investments, you really can't have a data and analytics revolution inside of your organization. So conversely, you know, if you do have a few leaders who really do see the potential, you know, they can, they can make the case for investing in data analytics and digital, and they can become extremely powerful allies for your, uh, for your transformation efforts. So another area that I want to focus on, and this is, you know, the all time best partnership in television, in my opinion, um, partnerships, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of different organizational models for digital and data transformations. There are chief data officers, chief technology officers, um, chief digital officers, CIOs, et cetera. And I think equally your digital and data teams can live in a number of different places. So ITS is a very common one. Um, you know, you can have it as a, as a separate entity that sort of exists beside the organization. It can, it can exist inside of a broader change portfolio. It can exist within your risk functions, et cetera. Any way you cut it, you've got to figure out who your partners are and you need to work together to make things happen. So we know that we have key partners in HR for data literacy. We have key partners in ITS for platform development. We have key partners in our digital transformation efforts for AI and automation related work know your partners and know how to leverage them. And that's something that, you know, we've had to, to really kind of um, take advantage of. So I'll pass it over to Deval here. Yeah, so thanks, Eric. That, that, that was a really interesting overview of our EDAS program. So, you know, the, the last concluding slide here is what have we learned uh, since we've been on our journey for quite some time now, right? So the first bullet that I have there, right? It's, it's think big, start small. Uh, just like Pivot, we have grand ambitions, but in order to get there, you have to start small to experiment, to try small things. Eric, what do you think of the next two there? Well, I think, you know, the, the, you're exactly right. I mean, starting with small iterations and building from there, um, you know, this is the exact approach we've kind of taken to building momentum in our data and analytics initiatives. It's been highly successful in driving data and analytic demand in areas that have traditionally lacked robust demand for data. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think the, uh, on the point of interdependencies too, this is a, you know, data and analytics is a change initiative. Digital is a change initiative. Your workforce strategy is a change initiative. You've got ongoing IT initiatives to transform that organization. There are interdependencies that cut across all of these, you know, people, skills, data, culture, IT. You have to understand that ecosystem and manage it properly. And uh, I you think bet. Yeah. The other point here, I mean, you know, as we sort yeah. of talked about earlier, you know, digital and data are two sides of the same coin. You can't really have one without the other. It's sort of strange to talk about a digital transformation <laughs> without talking, you know, about your data and analytics work. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And then the very last point there, you know, I, I got that statement from when I was listening to Ted Kawasaki's talk. Uh, and he talks about, you know, don't let the bozos grind you down because this is hard. This is hard work. It sounds easy. It sounds, you know, pretty cool and slick and things like that. But this is hard work. And and within a, a, an organization such as the bank, you know, you're going to have the people who who resist change, right? I call them the, the corporate leukocytes, right? Uh, given that, you know, we're all fighting this disease right now in the, in the pandemic. It's, you, you bring something new into the organization and they just harp on it. Like, why are we doing this? You know, and, and, and they will push and they'll push. So if you really want to see change, if you really want to see advancements in not only digital, but also in the, in the data world, uh, you have to keep find, uh, fighting uh, against that against that tide there, right? So, so I'll leave you with that last statement. Don't let the bozos grind you down. Uh, so with that, I think Eric and I uh, will, will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and we'll uh, send it back to you guys. Thank you, Deval and Eric, for this great presentation. So, like I said in the beginning, you can use your uh, on the right uh, the, the of your screen the tab of questions to ask any question. 
So uh, maybe in meantime, I have a question for you guys. So you, um, during the presentation, uh, I think especially you, Dava, you emphasized the importance to do experimentation for validation mm -hmm. for collecting data. Maybe can you talk about uh, your experience for, for, to do this in more in the context of machine learning? But what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes you have to try new things, you know, yes. for the sake of the model to, to make the, 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 the learning more efficient. But it could uh, contain risk, operational risk. Maybe it could end up making a customer unhappy because they are not used to get this kind of information. But sometimes you have to, for the sake of learning, you have to try this thing. Maybe it's the Absolutely. most efficient way for the machine learning perspective, but not necessarily for your, um, let's say, um, uh, business unit. Yeah. How do you manage this uh, situation with your experience? Yeah, so, so I'll give you a concrete example uh, in terms of one of the uh, machine learning experiments we did. So we called it the art of the possible. And, and the context behind this is we get a lot of survey data that comes into the bank that we send out to, to people. And then there's people who are reading the survey, categorizing the data into different categories. And it used to take time and energy and effort to, to do this work. And sometimes, you know, you get the survey results last minute and then you're struggling and you're scrambling. And, and that brings in errors. That brings in, you know, not a complete uh, sort of picture because you weren't able to do half the service because you didn't have time to categorize it, et cetera. So we implemented a, a machine learning model there that looked at this data that came in, free text boxes, looked at not necessarily keywords, but, you know, use some type of intelligent algorithms to figure out, okay, this is related to the Canadian economy. This is related to technology. This is related to inflation or whatever it might be that the economists needed. And that work that used to take, I think it was four days of two people doing this work was done within half a day, right? Oh. And then, and then we didn't, we didn't aim for 99% accuracy. We aimed for 80% accuracy as an example. 50% was even better. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, the, and then the two people would go on and look at the data and like, oh yeah, it's categorized properly. Ah, this, this one, what is this? Okay, let's go back and look at the serve. No, nah, no, nah, this, is, this is not right. Maybe this should be, ca and then you go back with that reinforced learning um, methodology to say, no, anything related to this, it has to go in here. And so over time, that data accuracy would increase from 50 to 60 to 80 to even 90%, for example. And what, the, what my colleagues did is rather than throwing this in production, they did it on a standalone, say, QA environment where they tested the model, tested the results over time. And then when they were confident that, look, we're not going to get more than 90% accuracy, we can deal with the 10% inaccuracy uh, and then have the human, if you will, look at it uh, okay. and, and figure out if that data makes sense. So, you talk about experimentation, it was a pure experimentation, but then from a leadership perspective, you're like, look, I'm saving you four days of mundane work of categorizing data. Now you can do more value added work, which is, which is the key here, right? To say, now I know where my data is categorized. Now I can provide some analysis to the leaders that need to see this data and make some decisions with it. So that's a, that's a quick example of um, how, we, how we do things. Perfect, thank you, thank you, Devar. So maybe one minute left. Any questions? Last chance. I'll give you a few seconds. I think we are fine. Thank you guys a lot for your time. We really appreciate it. on behalf of Ivado. Thank you and talk to you soon, guys. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Take care.